the average person you meet on the street that doesn't have experience, not just with cardiac arrest, but with any sort of chronic yeah, yeah. You know, medical condition that has to be handled. It's not, you know, I had a cold and, or, <laughs> and then I got better and yeah. I, then I just ride off into the sunset and life goes on. You know, yeah. life can go on, but it might not go on in the way that you were anticipating, right? What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm Yelis Fass, the founder of the Heart Warrior Project and a cardiac arrest survivor. In this podcast, I talk with fellow cardiac arrest survivors to provide emotional support to anyone else out there who might also have experienced this roller coaster. The journey of surviving uh, a cardiac arrest is a crazy one, and it's not only very confusing, but honestly, it can also be very lonely as well. From the outside, we as survivors often look fine, yet the struggles we deal with are more than people who did not have to go through this can even grasp. Now, in this episode, I talk with heart warrior Jasmine Wiley, who at the time of recording has been a cardiac arrest survivor for more than 13 years. She definitely is way more of a veteran dealing with all this than, than I am. Uh, for me, someone who is clocking uh, close to two years now, it was definitely very insightful to talk with someone who has been dealing with all this for such a long time. There is a lot of knowledge and wisdom in this episode that I hope you too will benefit from. Jasmine is also one of the admins of the very popular support group on Facebook called Cardiac Arrest Survivors. And uh, she's been doing that for more than a decade now. Uh, she's also a moderator on another popular support group on Facebook called Living with an ICD. I personally can highly recommend you checking out Boats. Uh, they have been just a huge help to me to feel less alone on this journey. And that's just not alone for me, but for so many other people who are in those uh, support groups as well. Now, some of the things Jasmine talks about here are her story of how she survived the cardiac arrest, dealing with memory loss for more than two years, her experiences with having had two shocks from her ICD, dealing with a heart disease, and so much more. Now, in the show notes located in the description of this episode, you can find links to any resources mentioned in this episode such as the uh, support groups, for example. You can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Jasmine to find them. Having said all this, I hope you will gain many insights and support from this episode with cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Jasmine Wiley. Jasmine, a uh, warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I I'm really grateful that you... That you are able to take time to do this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. So um, you are the admin of uh, the very popular Facebook group, uh, Cardiac Arrest Survivors. Are did you started actually or? Uh... No. So um, because of the way in which grassroots things begin, um, <laughs> I don't have an organized history of the group. I wasn't the one who started it. Um, that is someone who is no longer a per, per, part of the community. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But it was started by a survivor um, many okay, years yeah. ago, just a little over 10 years ago. And wow. it was a group of us that had met elsewhere online and went to Facebook because that's where people were. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I was one of the, the original members of the group and I have been one of the people who have remained all of these years and wow. helped ensure that it keeps going. Yeah, because 10 years, that's that's actually quite a while already. Damn. And it, it's, you know, we just reached 5,000 people. Yeah, yeah. Which is really, you know, maybe not amazing for some, you know, topics, but for cardiac arrest survivors, co-survivors, or, or people that are personally affected by cardiac yeah. arrest, 5,000 yeah. is... It's a number. You know, potentially the largest online community uh, for that of that sort in the world. Uh, so we've gotten the attention of you know the research community and and things like that because we've become such a powerful community. Yeah, I mean, I 
I've really felt the benefits of joining that support group. Uh, I'm so actually grateful for all the admins who are running it and all the people, of course, who are there, yes. right? And I read a lot about other survivor story, uh, but I've never, uh, yeah, I've never read yours. And I'm not saying that right. you haven't shared yours, right? But right. that's also how, how I actually want to start here is by yes, asking absolutely. And I think that's, your story. Yeah. I've shared my story many times, but I okay. think my connection to so many people like yourself is that I'm the leader of the community, right? That's become my story rather than what I personally went through. But I am not just some random person who decided to run a support group. <laughs> I actually am a cardiac arrest survivor. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my cardiac arrest was 13 years ago in 2009. Uh, I was 24 years old at the time. Wow. Um, so I w was a young survivor, less so yeah. every year. Um, <laughs> I had my cardiac arrest in bed. Uh, I was at home in bed. Thankfully, I don't sleep alone. Um, yeah. yeah. My husband was in bed beside me, and he woke to the sound of my gasping uh, or agonal respiration. And so he woke up to that noise, sort of, you know, saw what the situation was. You know, he didn't have any medical training or anything, but he knew something was very, very wrong. And so he called 911 and did CPR as best as he could until emergency responders arrived and took it from there. So I, I was a comatose survivor. You know, I didn't spring up and <laughs> turn into the me I am today right away. You know, I, I was cooled given the, the therapeutic, the cooling treatment. Um, the cooling treatment? Mm -hmm. uh, it's these days is called targeted temperature management. 13 okay. years ago, it uh, was called therapeutic hypothermia, where they lower your body temperature. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just sort of um, in an easy way, it, it, it helps with your neurological outcome. So people who are comatose after resuscitation and, you know, have all these other signs of that they're potentially going to be someone with a severe brain injury. This oh, is a treatment yeah. that was used to sort of, you know, help make sure that I would wake up and be able to talk. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so they, they place you in an artificial coma or how did they I, do it? I was already in a coma. They kept me in a coma. Oh, they, yeah. Okay. If that makes sense. So yeah. yeah, it was an induced coma, but I was already comatose. So they kept me in a coma uh, for a while. And, and then three days later, so things weren't looking good as far as the signs of, you know, if I was going to make a, a good recovery, if I had good neurological function. My initial assessment wasn't great. Okay. And so then they cooled me. And three days later, when I woke up, I was talking. I knew who my family was. And that was amazing. <laughs> I, I, I was pretty confused. <laughs> I didn't know what year it was. I, you know, had a had to, to get some therapy to, to look, walk and, and things like that. But I quickly made a lot of progress. Um, so I was discharged actually one week later. So within the first few days, sort of, you know, made a huge progress and was discharged one week exactly after. And... That's the tricky part, right? When you go home. It is, right? Then it's up to you, right? Yeah. And, and then, you know, yeah. because I was in a smaller city, um, I wasn't one of those people fortunate to live near one of the great, you know, follow-up treatment centers. And so my, my providers did the best they could, but my follow-up was just cardiology, um, endocrinology, and a primary care physician and device clinic. And so I didn't have a lot of, or an integrated follow-up team that, but I had a lot of good providers that did the best they could for me with the resources that were available and made sure that my needs were met or would have made referrals if they weren't met. and. And I had the support of family, and that was huge. 
Yeah, that's already a lot, right? Um, yeah. But I have to say for me as well, like I felt like I was thrown out of the hospital and that was it. That's, it was and you me. know, that's, that's how I describe hmm. when I have the opportunity to speak on this topic, especially to those who are perhaps not survivors, but who hmm. study and treat and write about these things. I always say I was just put in a car and sent home with my yeah, husband, right. who was, you know, pretty traumatized himself from everything he just went through. <sighs> Yeah. And and we had to, to sort it all out. And it's hard for me to speak about my recovery and how we navigated that early bit that was really hard on everybody because I don't remember it. I have a lot of memory loss. People who meet me now, like you, uh-huh. <laughs> may not think of me that way, but I don't re- I didn't retain memories from the first couple of years. Oh, years, because well, I... All, this is all stories. <laughs> oh, right, because I, I I, mean, when I wake, woke up from... They also placed me in an artificial coma, right, to, mm-hmm. to stabilize me. But I couldn't remember for some days. But then my memory was able to pick up things and remember. But for you, it was for I, more than right, a year. Right, because or... things... Even if I was okay, I was talking and, you know, okay by, by cardiac arrest standards. Sure. Yeah. Things weren't yeah. sticking in my brain, right? So oh. I may have remembered, you know, my childhood or what I learned in college, but I wouldn't remember what happened yesterday or a month ago. <laughs> so yeah. that was a big part of my recovery was wow. was the neuro recovery as someone who was not severely, you know, impaired. And so a lot of that was just, it had to work itself out. (laughs) I didn't need inpatient rehab or or anything like that. I just had to keep going and, you know, do things that that I could handle and adapt my life and take a lot of reminder notes, (laughs) rely heavily on my calendar and, and all of that. The joke is that I was like the, you know, the movie 50 First Dates? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. It's been, wow, um, it's been a long time. So yeah. that was the joke. Ah. <laughs> this is how I was for a while. Yeah. Because it, it was pretty similar. I was pretty upbeat and in good spirits. But my brain was not able to process a lot of complex things and retain a lot of information. So it was a lot of, you know, small steps forward and occasional steps back. and yeah. and. And I got there eventually. So that's that's a big part of my story. And I didn't talk about that for many years, except to my peers, <laughs> like in a Facebook community, or to my, my doctors or the people sure, I know sure. close uh-huh. in my life, my family, you know, they know what was happening. But it's it's a you know, you don't walk into a job interview and say, I forget a few years of my life, will you give me a job? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of questions that follow from when you say that, yes. right? Yeah. And so mm. I think I had to be comfortable with sort of where I ended up before I was able to feel comfortable talking about that piece of my story. And so I learned to talk about my cardiac arrest and my recovery and what I knew happened. Right. I, I knew what happened, even if I didn't remember it. <laughs> so I learned I learned to talk about it that way. And I think that was also helpful to me to sort of not make that as hard of a thing that I have to carry around for the rest of my life, that I have this chunk of memories from my mid 20s just gone. <laughs> but it was for more than a few years that you couldn't remember anything. Yeah. So it just spans from a couple of weeks maybe before my cardiac arrest and then I have no memories at all for wow. maybe I don't know a year or two and then some spotty ones yeah. it, it was it's kind of hard to you know put an end date and fit it neatly in a box because it it came back in pieces and so but by the the second year uh, or after two years I started to retain some memories and by the third year, it was pretty clear. Like, I have a pretty good sense of everything from three years after onward. So. 
I mean, I'm really glad that it's working. Every, that right. everything is working, right? But two years, that's a while. That's a long time to have to go through this. Yes. And even all these years later, it's, it's, it's strange because it's, it's like something that, that you constantly, not constantly, it's very infrequent now. Um, but there's occasional reminders that this, this is something I went through. Um, I had in, something. In which way? Earlier this year, I found a photo of something I had painted oh. for a friend when she had her baby who is yeah. now like 12 or 13, you know, it was right after my cardiac arrest. <laughs> so it was in that first year and I had painted something for her daughter's nursery and she found it in a closet and took a picture of it and sent it to me and said like, you know, or, or somehow I, I became aware of this and I thought, I, I mean, that's my work, but so I don't freaky. remember making it. <laughs> I had no idea it existed, you know? So it's there's little things like that where occasionally and talking to my family, you know, because so much of our our family relationships and long term relationships with friends and stuff is reminiscing about memories. Right. And so when I speak to my family that knows, you know, that really understands what I went through more than the surface level of most people in life, they will say things occasionally of, oh, yeah, I remember when so-and-so got married. That was this year. Do you remember that? And so it's, a, it's, it's not something we think about, or it's just part of my life that I forget a few years. Uh, but I, I, I'm really fortunate that that's not something I deal with long term. Um, even though I was considered to have a good outcome because I was functional, uh, it wasn't certain that I would ever be someone who was able to remember everything that happened, you know, clearly after I had recovered. And, and I did get there. It took a while, but I did get there. And I'm really thankful for that. So I remember, you know, the last decade. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's really right? good. But so it's, it's hard for me to speak about my recovery, I think, because yeah, so much yeah. of what I know about it is the perspectives of other people or things that were in my medical record or mm. or also my my own perspective at the time. I wrote a lot and I'm an avid social media user. Mm. <laughs> so those little Facebook memories <laughs> that pop up, sometimes they fill in pieces of of what happened to wow. me or what I was feeling at the time or things like that. But how do you deal with like, because almost every survivor at least can resonate partly with forgetting, you know, the events and right. some of the days. But for you, it was so much longer and so much more intense, right? But it's still every time that I hear my girlfriend, because it happened actually in the same way that it happened to you. Like I was sleeping and my girlfriend noticed like, this is not going right here. So, but every time that I hear her talking about those days, it, it, it just feels so weird. It's so weird because I, I remember nothing of it. Right. But how do you deal with this? Like, because for you, it's been, it's been, it's been two, it's been multiple years. Right. How do you deal with that feeling or, yeah. I think, I think I've learned over time, um, to the way I've put it away in my head, to be at peace with it, to make it just a part of my story, not the totality of who I am, right? I think I have learned to view it almost as to see the positive in it. You know, I, I put a silver lining on it and I've allowed myself to think of it as I was spared the memory of of the parts that were really, really hard. And I think every survivor, because like you said, most of us forget at least some time, right? It may have just been the event or a few days or, you know, maybe a few weeks. Mine is longer. And, but I think I've learned to put it away in my head as it was a really hard thing to go through. And because I'm so aware of 
how it was for my family and for my support system. Mm -hmm. And also because I'm aware of how it is for other people, right? Like other survivors and other family members that I've met over the years, you know, it's often that's the part that becomes really hard to carry with us, right? Of how hard it was, of how alone we felt, of how we didn't feel our needs were being met or like enough was being done for us or we were just really lost and didn't know what to do. And I don't have that as actual memories. So, you know, I I get to sort of put my own spin on it. <laughs> and 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 view it as, you know, I was I was spared that trauma of dealing with it, the hardest parts. I don't remember the hard parts. I don't have to carry that around with me the way my family does. I do have to carry around the fact that I am missing a few years of my memories. <laughs> but at least I don't have to remember those early parts of recovery when it was really hard and we didn't know if I was going to be okay, if I was going to be someone who could do an interview, if I was mm. going to be someone who would go on to live a full life, or if I was going to be struggling like that forever, because there's really no way to, I mean, I'm sure there's medical ways, but you know, you don't really know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And so I didn't ever have to, I don't have to have memories of that uncertain period. Okay, I see. My yeah. memories start when it was like, no, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> the better part of it then. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it was still hard, you know. It was sure. because yeah. I don't yeah. think I don't think I had sort of grasped what this meant for my life or dealt with it emotionally or or any of the rest of that bit until I was much better until I was back to I could then I could get started on that really hard piece of it right hey my apologies for interrupting the conversation it will just take a moment if you like the conversation so far and would like to support the heart warrior project check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow heart warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been, and well, still is in many ways. To show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the heart warrior project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs and if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug, or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right. Thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Do they actually, like the cardiac arrest, do they have any idea why it happened? Mine? Yes. So yes. I actually got a cause. Um, I have congenital long QT syndrome uh, and I would later genetically tested uh, type 2 long QT syndrome. Okay. And And I have a family history that we now know is probably <laughs> that the people in my family that that were lost at a young age, it was likely due to this. We didn't know what it was back then, but but it all makes sense once once we knew this is what I'm dealing with. My father was also diagnosed um, when I was in the hospital. Oh, so was, they also tested your family, right? So that was part of, you know, the, the mystery diagnosis, figuring out what's wrong with me situation. Wow. They knew I had QT prolongation. They knew my EKG was, you know, that I had a long QT interval. 
Mm-hmm. But that can be caused by medicines, situations, you know. Right. So to sort of tease out what was causing it, part of the diagnosing me was, you know, slapping some EKGs on my family members <laughs> to mm-hmm. see yeah. did anybody else have it. And my dad did. And my dad is the one with the family history that fit the clinical picture of long QT syndrome. So he is much lower risk than me. The risk sort of varies by individual because of lots of other factors, you know, your gender, et cetera. So my dad is lower risk. He takes medication and he's he's remained, you know, fairly symptom free and and just has to check in with his doctor and take medications and all of that stuff. And there's some other people in my extended family that were diagnosed. Um, so hopefully I'm the last person who who has to go through that yeah. to get a diagnosis in my family. Um, mm. I I don't view that the, it's not the best way to get diagnosed with a genetic condition. It's a very abrupt, dramatic way to get a diagnosis, but it's not the worst way. You know, postpartum is the worst way. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. It's worse after having to have gone and, yeah, have a cardiac arrest and and have to go through all that. And it's possible that, you know, if I had not survived or if I had not survived my hospital course, I would have never got a diagnosis. You know, mm. I would have been idiopathic. Yep. Unless postmortem genetic testing was done or, or all of that complicated things. And so mm. that's the way I was diagnosed. I've learned, as I said, I learned to spend things in a way that I'm okay with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I've learned to view the dramatic way that I was diagnosed with this condition as I made it easy on the doctors. I made it very easy on the doctors to, you know, help figure out what was wrong with me because we had a whole bunch of data, (laughs) Uh, you know, heart recordings and things like that. We had a whole lot to work with. And I also made it really easy on them to know what the appropriate level of treatment is, right? I declared myself to be a high-risk case. I proved that I have the potential to, you know, drop dead. And so that made it easy to know what my long-term treatment should be and that I was a good candidate for an ICD. Yeah, so you have an ICD now, right? After the cardiac arrest, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, Um, because hmm. because my long QT syndrome is, you know, going to be with me. I've had it since I was born. I just didn't know. Yeah. Uh (laughs) And it's going to be there, you know, forever. So Uh what are the implications of having it? Like, like what are the dangers of having it besides, well, the cardiac arrest, I guess. But are there other, other, I don't know, like. So it's a, it's a, it's not a progressive um, condition. It is Uh purely electrical, right? Yes. Uh It's, it's a channelopathy. It's a dysfunction of the ion channels in the heart and so it trips up electrically and you can have an arrhythmia which can present as a faint because it stops on its own or it could be a cardiac arrest which requires resuscitation um and so but there's really no other symptoms right it doesn't really cause other symptoms other than this you know that's why it falls in the category of like sudden arrhythmia death syndromes it's totally healthy people that just have this potential to drop dead. And so the as far as managing it, um, I have an ICD as my treatment. Um, and it works also to prevent a- rights or is it also like pacing? So I, I, the normal first line treatment for long QT syndrome, like my father's treatment is to take a beta blocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I do not tolerate beta blockers. Mm -hmm. So my treatment for now, because, you know, things could change if needed. My treatment for now, which for now has been a lot of years now, um, is just my ICD. I, it, it can defibrillate me as plan B, right? And I'm paced to prevent bradycardia and pauses. And that's somehow helpful at, potentially preventing the conditions that could lead to me developing arrhythmias 
in my specific case. So it works as a pacemaker about 40% of the time. Mm. Um, I don't feel that. Mm -hmm, That's good. (laughs) It just keeps my heart from going too low. Yes. And keeps it all nice and steady. So I don't have the right conditions to where something could trigger uh, me to go into an arrhythmia is the easy way to describe it. And, and I have had, I've been shocked two times. Oh, you have um, been? Mm-hmm. Well, 13 years. <laughs> Wait, 13 years ago? No, I, I mean, it, over the span of 13 oh, years. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, when was the first time? The first time, um, which was the appropriate one. So one of my shocks wasn't needed. Oh, one of them okay. was needed, so it was appropriate, which means it potentially saved my life. Yeah. Um, so I was glad to have it that day. And that was within the first year. It was about 11 months after, just under a year later. And the remarkable thing about that, which I think was really helpful, not just to me, but also to my family, particularly my husband, mm-hmm. because it happened in the exact same way as my cardiac arrest. Oh, wow. I was in bed. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Early morning, in bed. Uh, I woke up. Birds were singing out my window. I just woke up like normal. It's morning time. Wake up. And then I got defibrillated. Oh, what a way to wake up. Holy crap. Yes. <laughs> so I was wide awake then. Oh. And I think I, I had an initial involuntary sort of emotional response, you know, like, and then I, so, cause it's an abrupt thing to experience. Um, yeah, so, yeah. You, know, mm-hmm. to be, you know, it's a big deal. And then you're like, Whoa, what just happened? And then mm. I woke up my husband and said, I just got shocked. Oh, he and didn't wake I, up from it. No. And then mm. I got up and I made coffee like it was any other day. Whoa. And then I called my doctor's office and sent a remote transmission with my my remote monitor for my ACD. Mm -hmm. Sent a remote transmission, said, I think I just got shocked. And they looked at the data and said, yeah, and it was appropriate. And you're good. And have a great weekend. (laughs) Whoa. (laughs) I have not been shocked and I hope I will never be shocked but I hope if you do, it goes just like that. <laughs> but exactly, right? That I'm just in the bed uh, and that it could be my alarm or something to wake right. me up. Uh, but still. But how how did he feel? Did it hurt? So, I mean, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so because I don't actually remember that one. I wrote about it. Oh. Um, mm, but I do it wasn't remember. Because year. Yes. So I do remember the second, the only other shock I've ever had, uh, which was not appropriate. Um, And I don't think it's necessary to get into the weeds of why here, because it's a really complex situation. Sure. Um, But it wasn't anything wrong with my device. It was just Mm. a complicated situation, and it shocked something that wasn't life-threatening. And so I was... I remember that. That was in 2014, I believe. So five years after my cardiac arrest. And I was out on a run with my husband. And we were walking at the time. We hadn't even started running yet. We were walking to get to an area that's good to run in. And I was walking and then I got shocked. And I, at first I thought I was in a bad neighborhood. And at first I was like, did I just get shot? (laughs) Oh. <laughs> I'm in the U.S., right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I knew something. I felt like something hit my back. So I was like, "What just happened?" And then I was like, "Oh, I just got shocked because it's a really unmistakable feeling." And you know, everyone has a different experience and describes it different, but it's very abrupt and unique experience that is you wouldn't mistake it for something else right you're not going to be like oh that was a a hiccup like it's really dramatic (laughs) and so you know quickly in my brain I was like what just happened and then I was like I just got shocked and so my husband is beside me Uh and he he doesn't know what's happening he saw from his perspective I sort of stumbled 
I didn't fall, but I, I sort of, you know, lurched forward a little bit, misplaced my feet. So I think from his perspective, it just looked like I tripped. Um, and so I said to him, I, I stopped and he stopped walking with me. And I said, I think I want to go home. I don't want to run. And he said, okay. And so we start turn around to walk home. We walk a few blocks. And then he says, what just happened? Oh. <laughs> and I said, well, I think I got shocked. If it wasn't uh -huh. that, then I, I need to call like, you know, a priest or Ghostbusters or something. <laughs> and so we went home and it was, it was at night. It was late at night. Um, and so we went home and I sat on the couch, made a cup of tea. I knew how to handle it and I'd been through it before, but I also knew what I was supposed to do. And I knew one shock for me means if I have one shock and I'm fine afterwards, it's not an emergency situation. I don't need to run to the hospital. I mean, unless I got injured or, you know, something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But as long as I'm okay, mm -hmm. I knew it wasn't necessary for me to panic and go get care. That as long as I was fine and only happened one time, mm -hmm. I just needed to focus on being calm. And so I went home, I sat on the couch, made a cup of tea, and I messaged a friend who has an ICD. Yeah, okay. And told her what happened. Mm -hmm. And that was helpful, I think, to have someone right. to talk to. Emotional support, yeah. right? Just someone who listens. And someone yeah. who gets it because yeah, yeah, people who don't have this life <laughs> yeah. would think, do you want me to call 911 or, you know, like... I think people often don't know how to respond to any sort of medical situation that's not something they're familiar with. And so mm. to message this friend of mine who had had been sort of one of my role models, who had been living with this for a very long time, who had been shocked before, who knew how to handle it, you know, who had a good understanding of things. And she, you know, gave me the, the right kind of feedback that I needed. So I, I had a place to talk about it with someone who understood and someone who, who sort of helped me come up with, well, I'm going to message my doctor and, you know, yeah. just think through my plan. Right. And then I went to sleep like 45 minutes later. <laughs> the bad thing about that situation was it the first time – the first shock I told you about mm -hmm. happened on a weekday, a business day during business hours. My clinic was open. I called them up and they were there. That second shock happened on a holiday weekend. Oh. And so my clinic was closed for the next three days. Yeah, <laughs> and yes, odd. if it was an emergency, I could have, you know, sought emergency care at a hospital. But it wasn't an emergency. And so I knew I just needed to stay calm, send a message, let them know it happened, and and hopefully hear back from someone of, you know, that I was doing the right thing. And I did. I got a message back saying, you know, like that, you know, glad you're okay and, you know, call first thing on Tuesday when we reopen and and you know, and, and we'll we'll look at it and all of that. So it was it was tough to wait 3 days. Yeah, um, right. Know what happened? <laughs> For sure. But I, I'm really proud of myself that I handled it as calmly as I could, and I carried on with my weekend. Like I said, it was a holiday weekend, and so the next day I had a family event. You know, get together, eat food with family, and and I was just carrying on like things were fine. And you know, the people who knew what had happened, like my mom, was like. She'd look at me every now and then like, are you okay? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And I, 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 I smiled my way through it and I made it until I could get in contact with my clinic and, and get more information and, and sort of make a plan for moving forward. And I'm thankful, even though that was not an easy situation to deal with, I'm really thankful that I felt prepared for what to do and how to handle it in a situation 
where my clinic's closed, you know, because sometimes the instructions people get are, you know, phone your doctor. But they don't say, what if your clinic is closed? (laughs) (laughs) And so I, I, I'm glad that I knew sort of all the variations of, of how that could occur and what I should do in those situations. And I think part of that was not just from understanding my own situation and my own, you know, care situation and how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. But also because by that point, five years into this, I had already started, you know, I was an information seeker and I had already connected with the community and I had already heard the experiences of others and read the papers about coping with shocks and all of that stuff. Okay. (laughs) And so I felt really prepared for what to do in that situation. Whereas someone who's new to this and just gets that one or two sentence, call your doctor, (laughs) may, may not feel as prepared for what to do Mm. when that situation arises. Wait, because this is good. Like, uh, I've never been shocked, but let's say that, well, yeah, at some point I might get shocked. Hopefully you don't, but if you need one, then I'm glad, I hope I'm glad you have it. (laughs) (laughs) But what would be some good tips for anyone listening also? Um, Because this is like, getting a shock is the one thing that freaks me the most out of, of having this. Yeah. Uh, you know, I will be happy if it's appropriate, but just when and where and it's just that freaks me out. And I have read on the Facebook group also many people who have had a shock that they live with such an anxiety and fear now. Yes. Like, how do you deal with that? Like, how have you dealt with that? And what would be tips if you get a shock that you could give someone? So I think it's interesting while there is a portion of of people who have traumatic experiences with shocks because they get multiple because of the situation it occurs in because of how they cope with it. It can certainly be a really hard, stressful, traumatic thing to deal with and all of that. I was one of those people that was more scared before it happened. And then after it happened, I was like, that's all that is. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. You know, yeah. like the anticipatory anxiety yeah. or whatever was worse. Like I had built it up to be like more yeah. harder than it was going to be when it actually happened. And it was like, oh, I can deal with that. And I think I framed it in a way that those of us who have an ICD after a cardiac arrest, instead of as a preventative measure, I framed it in that way. This was so much better. You know, I didn't have to go to an ambulance. I didn't have to be in a coma. I wasn't on life support. My husband wasn't traumatized. He slept through it or was just walking beside (laughs) me, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and I think Mm. that I framed it as in comparison to if I'd had that same arrhythmia and didn't have a device, Mm. how that was, because I know how that was. And I I framed it in that way and that helped me, I think, be more comfortable with it happening. That is not to say I enjoyed it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I, it is not my idea of a good time. Uh, I would like to go many, many years without (laughs) that happening and, you know, maybe always, but it's good to have it as a, as a, as a backup in case I need one. Um, And I think the thing that I would say to others who who maybe haven't experienced yet the uh, something i notice when i hear other survivors other icd users talk about it we're often given so little information right the patient education piece that we get initially is often very very brief and or it may be verbal and we have memory issues, or it may get lost in the overwhelming amount of information we're getting on everything else. And so that's something for those who have an ICD that haven't been shocked yet. The next time you're at a device check or checking in with your doctor, 
clarify what should I do, you know, if this happens and make sure that those, you can't tell everyone you're ever with, but you know, your family, the people you live with, you know, those people know also, you know, how to handle it and how they could best help you, I guess. Um, I, I'm thankful that my, my husband who was present for both of my shocks, <laughs> He's a really calm guy. Um, you know, he's a he's an engineer and he has that personality type and he, he's he's a really calm person because I think if I had been with someone who panicked would freak out. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I think that would have either made me freak out or yeah. made me try too hard to calm them down, which is really hard to do when you're trying to deal with your own stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's very stressful. <laughs> yeah. So I think knowing what to do, um, even though we can't, you know, there's a million scenarios because it could happen at any time, right? You know, they just put these in, tell you it's maybe some basic information, and they send you out in the wild. And, you know, it could happen at any time, and you can't have a plan for every possible scenario and situation <laughs> All of that, but but have a a good grasp of sort of the right thing for you to do if it occurs, and so when it happens, you're not in that state of initial like oh my gosh, you know, and you don't have to scramble to find that information or to find out how to handle it because that may lead to you, I don't want to say overreacting because it's a really hard thing and I'm not trying to suggest that people who do this are overreacting, but sometimes if you don't know what to do, people might call 911 or run to a hospital and it might not have been necessary for the situation, but they don't know what to do and they panic and they think, I need medical care. And so they get it and then they have to deal with the stress of getting medical care. <laughs> and they might just be told, there's no one here to read your ICD, you're fine, you know, follow up on normal business hours. And, and so having an idea of, of what to do before you're in that situation, I think helps you not have to, to you, you know what to, to do when you're in that panic state. If you're like, no, I know what to do. It, it, it gives you a starting point for, for how to approach moving forward after such a dramatic thing occurs. Right. Like having a step-by-step -step plan sort of written down of like, okay, do this first and that and that and staying calm in the process and that's, for sure. Yeah. That's a big, big piece of it. And it's, yeah. you know, you can't just snap your fingers and be, you know, not everyone's going to get shocked and they just immediately start doing yoga or yeah. <laughs> meditating or whatever. Yeah. But I think, I think that's a piece that it's been studied. There has been research done on this. There's a super famous paper uh, by a um, psychologist that focuses on cardiology, uh, Sam Sears, that's about coping after a shock. And one of the pieces of that is how feeling prepared for what to do, knowing what to do. And it, the, the paper has a sample, you know, this is what a shock plan would look like. And knowing what to do is not going to make it, you know, a jolly good time, but it, it does help reduce, you know, it helps you cope with that situation because you know how to handle it. and. From my personal experience, it's, I don't know, it sort of makes you feel good about yourself to know how to handle. You don't need other people, right? Like, you're not, you don't need, like, when you have a cardiac arrest, it's the most disempowering yeah. situation you can be in, right? You yeah. are totally dependent on other people helping you. For me to get shocked and then say, oh, I just got shocked to my husband. Like, I don't need his CPR. <laughs> I don't need him to, you know, get an ambulance. I don't need him to whatever. Or if I did, I would be able to ask for that, right? Mm -hmm. So you're in control more so than if you didn't have one. Yeah. 
And, and I think knowing what to do and being able to communicate that to those around me was really, it made me feel, I was really proud of how I handled it. Like I walked around feeling like, you know, I did the right thing and like I handled it really well. And like, and I, I don't know that it made it easier on me, but it certainly didn't make it harder because I knew what to do. Yeah. Uh, the research paper that you were talking about, for everyone listening, I will try to find it and I, I'll just link, uh, put it in the, the show notes of this episode. Um, is there anything, you know, that you wished your cardiologists would have told you sooner? Or has there been something that you wished you would have discovered sooner about surviving a cardiac arrest and living with an ICD that you would... Yeah, share to listeners? Um, I think, I mean, there's a lot. Right? I know, <laughs> there's probably there's a, a lot. lot. I wish I had known sooner. Um, I, th I think, you know, you can't go through this overwhelming situation of having a cardiac arrest of being diagnosed with a heart condition and getting an ICD or, or whatever piece of it you know, applies to your situation. They can't just, you know, transmit all that knowledge to your head like, mm -hmm, yeah. right away. And so, you know, I, I do think having bite-sized pieces of information and knowing where to go when you have more questions is a really big piece of this. Um, the piece that I would say to cardiologists, because you yeah. mentioned that, mm -hmm. I was really lucky. Uh, I had a fantastic doctor, a cardiac electrophysiologist, who sort of, you know, took the reins of my situation and made sure my care was coordinated and 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 did it in a very human way, um, and you know, didn't treat me like patient number whatever, <laughs> but the the me, the real person that was sitting there, that was someone who would have to go on with their life. But not everyone gets that sort of personalized care right and i think i wish that they would know that this is all really hard i mean even if they know it's all really hard but we're trying the best we can with a really hard situation yeah, and yeah. so you know if we seem anxious or panicked or have too many questions or or whatever <laughs> that that's just a normal reaction to the situation and you know, having having that seeking out information. The other piece is, I would say that seeking out information for some people is actually how they cope. I'm a woman, and those many years ago, I I was um, you know a younger woman, and so I get the bias of you know treat. There can be bias against young women that seem anxious as you know that it's just anxiety that you know like we, we're hysterical i just need to calm down yeah you're right yeah yeah uh -huh. and i'm sure men encounter that too and all kinds of people but mm -hmm. i think i've encountered i've seen a lot of doctors over the years you now um i've moved i changed insurance i've you know so i've had six cardiologists um huh. i like the ones that don't assume me speaking fast or having a lot of questions means mm. I need therapy for anxiety. That's just me seeking out information right. that I need to cope with this and to feel prepared for things that could happen because I live with a lot of uncertainty in my life and knowing what the, the things I need to know are not always relevant for right now, but they're things I'm worried about could happen or, and it's it's not that I'm worried really, but I think this could happen. What would I do in that situation? So sometimes I've had some not great experiences uh, with doctors where I say, you know, if this ever happens, what could I do? If this ever happens, what could I do? And they think like, you need to calm down. And it's like, but I need that information. So patting me on the head and soothing me is not the right approach. <laughs> No, not at all, right? It's really right. frustrating. I, right. And I, I think there are some people who certainly do find information, too much information at once, 
stressful. But then there's this subgroup of people that are information seekers. And that if our doctors don't point us in the right direction, we're going to go home and Google and we're going to find it on our own. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I prefer the doctors that, that recognize that seeking out information is not necessarily an indication of anxiety. Yeah. It's just me trying to cope with this reality that I live, which cannot be conveyed in a 20 minute doctor's appointment, right? <laughs> I know. And that's the whole problem, right? Every time that I'm going to an appointment again, every six months, I have so many questions. And each appointment, I have so many more questions, but I never right. have time to ask them because after 10, 15 minutes, it's like, all right, you got to go out and it's the next, next person. There, yeah, it's frustrating, right? Especially for takes, something like this. Yeah, and it takes, you know, years mm. to, because like you said, we only get the, you know, you only have so much time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you only get to ask a few questions and you may not know what questions to ask, right? You don't yeah. know what you have questions yeah. about until things happen or you learn mm -hmm. about things. And, mm -hmm. you know, so you you get an opportunity to ask those few questions at every appointment. Well, and then you, you know, you go to appointments for years and then you're like me 13 years later and I've absorbed all of this information and I feel like my need for education and information has been met both by my medical providers, but also from seeking it out on my own. And that is, I think, the piece where I think the medical community can do better. Um, I agree. There's a lot of there's a lot of needs <laughs> in this yeah. population, right? And we can't, you know, wave a, a magic wand and make everyone have access to the best care and you know have all the the best situation. But I think we could be better at the sort of information education piece of things that help people navigate their way through this really messy situation of surviving yeah. a cardiac arrest. I know when they were, when they placed the ICD in me that I received in the hospital, just like a small brochure about what it is, but it was like two pages or so, like really tiny. And I was like, okay, this is all I have to know. Uh, right. I had my, I talked to my mother um, about uh, this uh, recently because of another project I'm working on. Uh -huh. And I talked to my mother about, you know, what, what kind of information did you did you guys get for me? Oh, they weren't yeah. giving me information when I was, you know, in that state. And my mom said, well, we got that pamphlet and we got a DVD. A DVD? A DVD back then. This was 13 years ago. Oh, all right. <laughs> I yes, dated yes. myself, right? Uh, <laughs> but I got a DVD from the device manufacturer. Huh. And apparently I watched it after I was home and it had a man on there who was skiing. Uh, he went skiing and he's like, I have an ICD and I went skiing and I look at my mom and I said, cause I was not in a, my cognitive functioning wasn't great at the time. And so I watched this and I look at my mom and I said, I have to learn how to ski now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So, um, you know, I think sometimes that the, the information that is given <laughs> is maybe not either enough for uh -huh. some people or it's not you know it maybe it's too much for other people because we're all different right and we all have different levels of of need for information and you know it's there the thing i have learned from all of my years of my facebook stuff which is not just moderate, which is not just being an admin of the cardiac arrest group, but I also moderate the living with an ICD group. Oh, you do. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean, which, that one, too, actually. Yeah. Yes. So I'm a, I'm a moderator of it. Oh, yeah. I just put out fires when they <laughs> <laughs> yeah. happen. And that group is like 12,000 people um, yeah. from all yeah. over the world. Um, it was started by a, a friend of mine who's much closer to you geographically than me. He's oh. in... Liechtenstein. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, that's not yes. far. Yeah. So, yeah, you're just hmm. a quick train right away. Yeah, basically. Okay. When I make it there, we'll, we'll have a drink or something. Uh, that would be great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, 
Uh-huh. My experience from from you know all all of this stuff with with people in these communities and how everybody has different needs and all of that stuff. Most of their questions that they have, there are answers to them. Sometimes they're easy to answer. It's just how do you find it, right? You know, how when you go when you're brand new to this and you want it, all you want to know is, you know, can I use a chainsaw with my ICD? You have to go to a website, you have to figure out where on the website to find the PDF to download, to, you know, and it's, it's, and I think a lot of people encounter this wall of information and they mm. think that's too overwhelming <laughs> or, or they don't even know where it is. And so, because they're not given enough information initially uh, to sort of, if you have questions, here's where to find the answers, right? And I think that's something that the medical community could do a lot better at making sure there's, you know, the the same thing that we do on Facebook, right? When someone asks a question, we we crowdsource our, we pool our knowledge and we, you know, can point them in the right direction or give them useful bits of information or or whatever for how to, to get that need met. And I think if there was better resources that did that same sort of thing, that would be really really helpful to people who are and to their family members as well yeah. right yeah right. um mm. i've when i talk about my personal situation i'm usually talking about my myself except for the initial part of recovery but there are a lot of people for different reasons because of their outcome because of maybe their way of managing mental health things related to it because they're a child, you know, because of a lot of that, you know, so it's also that information needs to be available to their people, to their caregivers, right? Jasmine, I just have two more questions, if you're okay with me asking. Absolutely. Um, over these years, what do you feel is still difficult to communicate to those around you who have not gone through this experience? That it, I think, hmm, I think it's difficult to communicate to people that it doesn't, surviving and going home from the hospital is not, and then she lived happily ever after, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a, a paper written by one of my, my favorite researchers that used the term chronic survivors of cardiac arrest. Mm, mm-hmm. And I love it so much because well, chronic who survivors. The who is the person? Um, uh, Sachin Ar- Agrawal, who is at Columbia University in uh, okay. New York. Uh, oh. It was a, a paper on a specific population, but used the term chronic survivors. And mm. I love this term because I think that's the piece that you and I know, right? Because we talk to other survivors and their family members and some of them are years out and they still have needs that have not been met and they still have a need to talk about it. And it's still a part of their story and they still need to, you know, learn to, to cope with it. And it's an ongoing thing. And I think people who are not familiar with this stuff are like, Oh, that happened to you and then you got to go home from the hospital and you're now you're just fine. Right. And I'm like, well, I mean, yeah, I'm fine. I, I have a heart condition and I have an ICD and I have to manage this the rest of my life. (laughs) And and I think that that's the piece that Mm. the average person you meet on the street that doesn't have experience, not just with cardiac arrest, but with any sort of chronic medical condition that has to be handled. It's not, you know, I had a cold and, or, (laughs) and then I got better and (laughs) then I just ride off into the sunset and life goes on, you know, life can go on, but it might not go on in the way that you were anticipating. Right. And so you have to learn to integrate all of the stuff that happened to you and, and, and then go on with your life in a different way often. 
Jamie, another survivor who has been on the podcast, said yep. that recovery, you know, doesn't actually stop. It's an right. ongoing process. And okay, chronic survivor, I like that word a lot too and it resonates. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think it's the same for those who are our people, you know, our family, our loved ones, our all of that, right? You know, if you gave CPR to someone that you love, is then you don't just magically you don't get to forget <laughs> about it. No. it. It's something you carry around with you and you have to learn to, to, you know, to deal with that in a way that, you know, every time you look at them for the rest of your life, you don't imagine them in need of resuscitation. You know, there's a lot of this stuff that's really hard. And I think to those of us that seem fine, uh, and I'm assuming you're one of them, you know, we look <laughs> at us, look at us. We look like totally fine people. I know it's crazy, right? right? But then the life that we live is... Right. Yeah. And I think if you're you're really good at coming across as making it look easy, mm. right? And I have been an example of this over mm. the years and things I've participated in. You know, I seem totally fine and I seem like it's all just been this really easy and, you know, just say something inspirational and that's the end yeah. of the story. And that's not the end of the story, you know, yeah, that no. there's a lot of layers to this and it's hard. And it's hard even for those of us who make it look like it's not. Yeah. All. Yeah. For. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. It's a lot harder than so many people actually. Yeah. Realize. Yep. Um. Yeah. It's a real crazy roller coaster. That's just all that I've been able to say since I survived it. It's so many ups and downs. It's constantly like that. Yeah. And that's and that's what recovery. I think. Mm -hmm. There's a a meme you've probably seen before. That's like the plan, and then it's like what actually happens oh, yeah. and it's just like <laughs> that one yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's mm. like that's exactly it you know it's mm. i think that we we view recovery from something be that a brain injury be that you know a mental health thing ptsd whatever we view recovery as this like linear upward trajectory right like and it's 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 not it's not as simple as it looks on a graph like <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's messy. It's two steps forward, one step back. It's, you know, a lot of twists and turns that you didn't anticipate. It's things coming up over the course of your life that will be these reminders of that you're dealing with this. I mean, sometimes I feel totally fine. Like I don't, I don't, I'm not thinking about my cardiac arrest. I'm not thinking about my ICD. I'm not thinking about my heart condition, but then something comes up that Oh yeah, I have to deal with this. It could be as simple as going to the dentist to get my teeth cleaned, mm. <laughs> right? And I have to tell them, fill out the form, you know, and then they're right. like, you know, it's, mm. that's a great way to scare medical providers is to <laughs> have a history of cardiac arrest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have so, to go still every six months to uh, the hospital as well? So for years, I did yeah. get my device checked every three to six months. Um, I've been stable cardiac wise for uh, a okay. really long time now. My device is functioning fine. I'm, I'm an easy patient, you know, I've got all my needs met, all of that. And so at the start of COVID, my clinic was allowing me to just do remote only, only come in if I need to. Oh, and they've continued that. So it's been almost three years since I've been seen in person by cardiology, which is a really long time. I've never went that long before. My device is still checked, you know, and my other general medical needs are met by my primary care physician and Wait, other remotely, care. How does that work? Is it just by the uh, the monitor that you received? Mm -hmm. That's all? That's, that's you it. You don't they have to Zoom call them or something. It's just yeah. that checks it. I just have done remote checks and then they okay. send me a message. That's not a typical situation. I think uh, most yeah. people have to go in or have a face-to-face, -face, even if it's remote, with a doctor at least once a year. Um, yep, yep. I, I'm just so many years into this and I'm stable and I'm doing fine and they trust that I'll communicate my needs and all of that. Right. So Makes sense. I've been able to go with very little cardiology care for a few years which is really great because not to get into it at the end of this interview, but I, I try to 
I don't like to spend my life in doctor's appointments, right? I, that's what becomes its own thing when you're managing lots of specialists. And I have an ICD complication that um, affects the nerves going to my arm. And so that's a whole big, we can do another episode about that if you'd like. I'd love to, but. It's a, a okay. whole situation. It's called thoracic outlet syndrome, but that's a, a, an ongoing thing that causes symptoms I have to manage and I get more frequent care for that. So that is my regular interactions with the medical system are, you know, with neurology. <laughs> Wait, what, what symptoms do you, do you get? Uh, it's a, it affects the nerves going to my arm. So I have nerve pain and. All, all the time. Or a specific, yeah. yeah, all the time. So yeah, it's interesting to live with um, and adapt to. So that's and I don't and I don't talk about that usually uh, because I don't want to scare people who may be newer to ICDs to think that something terrible is going to happen to them. It's a very rare situation. It's. You know, I, I moderate a group with 12,000 people with ICDs, right? Yeah. And I know of like two other people <laughs> who've had this situation. Wow. So it's really rare and it's unfortunate that it happens to me. Um, but it makes me, who's already a complex patient <laughs> with a rare condition, even more rare and complex. Wow. And so as I approach my medical care and what the right thing for me is I try to do it in a way or I've learned to do it in a way where I'm getting my needs met, but not, I don't want to be over cared for. Right. Because I don't, I don't, I really don't need more than a handful of appointments mm. a year. You still want to do other things in life, right? Right. You know, it's, <laughs> and, and I've had mm. things, things offered to me before that's, you know, you could, this is a, a treatment or this is a, a support mm. service or something. And I'm like, how would I be able to go to work? How would I be able to? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Because we're not just patients when we're in the office. We have a life. Like, we we yeah. have lives. Like we walk out of that door and we have lives that we have to manage. And I mm -hmm. think that's something that mm. often is not at the forefront of the minds of the people who are, are helping support us get our medical needs met is that sometimes, you know, you're a person who exists in a medical setting. Yeah. You know, you're wearing a gown sitting on a paper <laughs> bed, and, you know, and, and that's not the reality of our lives, right? Like we have families, we have homes, we have lives and jobs and hobbies and things to manage and all of that. So it's, it's hard to find that balance between getting enough care, but not too much. And because I'm so complicated, <laughs> I've, I've, I've learned over the years and it's not been easy to sort of make sure my needs are being met, to voice my needs, to ask when I feel like something is missing from my care, but to also speak up and say, I don't know if that's helpful for me. Can I can I come back in in a year instead of six months, you know, yeah. and sometimes you do get to have a voice in the way that your care is managed and that makes it work better for your situation. But did this start already in the beginning or did it develop at some point? The, the ICD complication? Yeah. No, it, it started four years into this. Um, so I had my device for four years and oh, wow. because of an activity that caused this pain and then we figured out that it didn't go away and, and then it became this really complex situation. And so I have had two revisions of my device and how it's placed to try to m improve the situation as much as possible. And it did help some but it's still something that I have to deal with. And it's really complicated because cardiology is involved, neurology is involved, I've seen a vascular surgeon. <laughs> like, it's a really complex thing just to have this diagnosis, but this is a diagnosis that's caused by my treatment for <laughs> another thing. So it's, it's really complicated and it's hard to address briefly, but I'm really yeah, fortunate right. that I have lived and it wasn't easy. I mean, for years, I felt like I was, you know, 
just completely overwhelmed with opinions and felt like a lab rat or a guinea pig, or, you know, and it was trying to make my way through this mess at the time of being really, really unwell because it wasn't well managed. Wow. And so that was really hard on me, on my family. It disrupted, you know, my career. It disrupted wow. everything. Yeah. And, but I made my way through that mess and now I have a good care team and I'm really lucky that I live in a major city that has really great medical care now. I live in San Francisco. And so, you know, we have some world renowned sort of places of care and doctors and and I've been able to get to a place where, yes, I still have to deal with this. It affects my life every day. I don't view it as a disability, but, you know, it does affect how I can do things and all of that. And you know, it does require me to have people available to reach out to when I have something that happens or I have a question or I'm struggling or whatever. So even if I don't see them very often, I need to know they're there. I need to know that my medical team, that the the doctors and the occupational therapists and all of those people are available. Or if I need mental health support because it's really hard to deal with this, you know, knowing that this team of people who I rarely see mm -hmm. <laughs> is there and available for me for when I need to reach out and not being afraid to reach out. Yeah. I think that's hard for a lot of people. Yeah, right. Yeah. Especially if you have a disposition like me. Um, mm. you know, I have the disposition of a, an old farmer who could cup off a finger and keep mending the fences, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, mm. I am, I'm not one to, to ask for help. Mm. Um, and so I think mm. that it takes a lot of courage sometimes to say to people, to people, whoever they may be, whether it's your care team, it's your doctors or whether it's your family or whoever, Right to reach out and say like, I need help with this. Yeah. It, it, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And it's taken me a lot of years to feel comfortable saying I need help sometimes. Um, and so that's some, a lesson I've learned from dealing with my arm <laughs> that I wish I had known earlier on when I was navigating the start of all this cardiac arrest, getting an ICD stuff, right? Is that reaching out, you don't have to know what you need, right? You don't have to tell them, I need this. You can just say like, hey, I need some help. Like, this is my problem. I need some help. Like, that's why those support systems we have, that's why they're there, right? You know, so people, I think, a lot of people are hesitant to ask for help. Perhaps some populations more than others. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. Like, you know, with the mental health piece, I think sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes I think, you know, it's what whatever, you know, like I think sometimes people like you might be in the category of not <laughs> wanting to, to reach out, you know. I, I mean, agree. I think I think I that, yeah, I think there are people who just think, no, I just got to tough it up and get through this, you know, yeah. like, and, and it's, it's okay to, to say you need help and it's okay to reach for that help Yeah. and keep reaching, you know, I mean, that's what we see on Facebook, right? And it's really magical mm -hmm. to, you know, these people are the wonders of my world and I see them reach out to each other and that is something that makes a difference in people's lives. You know, it may not meet all their needs, but at least they're reaching. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not just like, they're not just struggling alone and they're not, you know, so even, even if talking to someone on Facebook <laughs> isn't going to meet your need, it's at least you're talking about it. And then you may be able to then apply that to your life otherwise. And, you know, and, and start to that process of getting your needs met and being yeah. able to articulate what your needs are. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. I'm so sorry that this happened. Like the IC, the problem with the ICD, that's just, that's very shocking to hear from me actually. Yeah, and, and I, wow. again, like I said, it's a rare situation and I don't want anyone who's watching this no. later to yeah. 
think it's going to happen to them, but we do know, right? When we get ICDs, all medical treatments are benefit versus risk, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know that an ICD can have really big benefit. It can save your life. So the risks that come along with it, you can tolerate them when you know you need one. And I have tested the limits <laughs> of how much risks we can tolerate. You know, I mean, that's been, it's been challenging to sort of have to remind myself that, you know, I needed this. I needed this. I may not be here right now if I had not got this device implanted. And even though it has caused these issues, which is not fun to deal with, it's, it's my best option. You know, it's, it's, there's, you know, I, and I hope that in the future there'll be better technology and things that are lower risk, right? Because I'm thankful too that, you know, the, the complication I've had is not life threatening, life altering. But, you know, we all know of the sort of life threatening potential things. You know, you could get a surgical infection, you could, you know, that sort of thing. You could have anesthesia risks or, or whatever, right? We know of that part. That happens with any surgical procedure. But the life altering part of this really rare complication was not something that I even knew could happen. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I don't know that it would have been better if I had known. <laughs> Right. Because there was no there's no need to know about it or worry about it. If it's unlikely to occur, um, you don't want to think it's going to happen to you just because it happened to this one person on the Internet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. But but I think I think it, it, it has taken a lot of work of framing this in a way that I can tolerate. And that was not just work that happened, you know, from. Facebook or whatever, you know, I've seen psychologists, I've worked with a lot of different, you know, providers over the years to sort of be comfortable with this. And it's, it's still something that I have to manage, you know, the rest of my life. And for me, I've learned to think of it as like, this is my arm issue, right? I don't connect it to everything else. And somehow keeping it separate is like, this is a separate issue, it affects my arm. Like makes it so I'm not I'm not mad about the fact that I had a cardiac arrest and got diagnosed with a heart condition that made me need a treatment that caused this, <laughs> right? Because I have to be at peace with all of those things, and so I I've, I've learned to sort of compartmentalize them. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Wow. God, it's so much that you have to manage, right? Wow. But I I. I and like we were talking about earlier, you know, that this is hard, even though for those of us who make it look easy, you know, if <laughs> yeah, you someone, definitely make if it someone look needs, easy, but right. wow. <laughs> I think, I think if, you know, if, if, if I was in the grocery store, mm. the assumptions that people make about me, you know, out on the street or, you know, <laughs> in, in a normal life situation, it's, it's shocking to them if they become aware of the fact that I had a cardiac arrest, I have a heart condition, I have an ICD, I have this complication that causes nerve pain. Like, because I think this is not, it's not how I present myself, which I think is really important to me. It helps in a way, right? It doesn't make you look like a victim or behave like one. And it yes. also psychologically affects you in that way, right? Right. right. Yeah. And I think I think that's very much how I approached. Yeah, it seems like my that. cardiac arrest stuff early on. Mm. And when I was more vulnerable, I think I thought this is a role, right? Because I think it's there's such this such expectation of gratitude and all of that placed on survivors. That yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the piece everyone's like, oh, you had a cardiac arrest. And it's like, like they all expect us to be giving TED Talks on the lessons we learned at all times, right? Yeah. <laughs> and don't talk about the hard parts, right? right? Like, don't say brain injury. Don't say mental health issues. You know, don't talk about the hard parts. Just say the positive things to inspire people. And I think that's, there. there is, 
and I was a, a good candidate for that. Um, I was this perky young lady that, you know, yeah. <laughs> had this pretty good outcome and was willing to speak. And I think I, I did a lot of things earlier on of sharing my story that was in this very sanitized surface level way that was just the positives and just the inspirational, you know, lessons learned kind of sure. thing from it. And over the years, because I've been doing this so long and I have talked to so many people and I have, you know, tried to help support so many people. And I think that's one of the things that I've learned from this is that it's, it's, yeah, it's great when someone has, you know, rides off into the sunset and lives happily ever after, right? But sometimes it's almost more helpful for people to hear from someone who has been through struggles yeah, and, and has done okay with it and has learned to cope with it. And so I've gotten more comfortable talking about the hard parts of my situation and over we, the years. We should, right? Because that's the reality for most survivors the reality for most survivors is not a happy ending but it's right. a roller coaster right that's the reality for so many and yeah for me also like i heard many doctors or other people also say after i survived it like oh you are so lucky you're so you must be so grateful and i'm always like it always feels very double like partly yeah i am grateful but at the other side, there was a cost to surviving this. And that's something that you don't have to deal with, but I do. And that cost does feel like a high cost at times. It's one yeah. with a lot of suffering. A yeah. friend of mine um, who, I don't know if she's a survivor, but she has an ICD and, and a, a, the same condition as I have. She's someone I connected with over the years. She framed it once one time she called it the price of admission mm -hmm. and i love yeah. that right yeah. you know the, the price of admission to be alive to be to remain alive to be a survivor to have someone with a life-threatening condition like you know it's a really high cost to pay sometimes and yeah. and i think that's why we need a place where to talk about it and that's sort of what my motivation for like with the Facebook groups, mm -hmm. that was, that's sort of been my, you know, why I had someone ask me recently, you know, you've been doing this for like over a decade for free. Like, right. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> why? Did you, right. Yeah. Because, for, you know, it stopped being a source of support for me. I mean, not really, but, but when you, when you step into a leadership role, you, you know, Yes, they're my peers, but I, you don't see me frequently posting about my stuff, right? <laughs> and so, you know, I have a, a handful of people that are my support system. Um, and But I think what, so what makes someone continue to do that, right? It's like, why would I, why would I keep doing that? They asked me that. And I, I said, you know, because these are the things that nobody else is talking about. Right. This is the part of surviving of, you know, living with these situation that people are not talking about. And so the phrase I used in a, a talk um, years ago was that we created an ex we created a space for the a place for these experiences to exist. And I think about that sometimes because so often I think those of us. We are so concerned maybe about our family members who might be traumatized from, you know, their perspective of things because that's really, really hard, right? So we, we might be concerned about, you know, those who love us and how they're affected. We might not want pity from people. We might not, you know, whatever the cultural conditioning of being a tough guy or whatever the, the reason is. Mm -hmm. I think we're often so concerned about how we are affecting others that we we we, you know, shine it up and, and try to just, you know, people ask how you are, you're, I'm doing fine, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and I right. think having a place where, to talk to other people who get it and who get yeah. that part of it, that it may be the only place that we share this stuff. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really important because that, the, the experience of, you know, survivorship that they're calling it these days is, it's not everybody, you know, in a stock photo 
picture, you know, from having a grand old time at a party and celebrating and being so <laughs> grateful, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's hard and it's messy and it's complicated and it's it messy and it's often, even if you get, you go through periods where everything is fine, then there might be something else hard that happens and then there might be something else hard that happens. And so, yeah, we're grateful, but we don't exist to inspire other people, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we, we don't, we can, you can be grateful and angry and sad and <laughs> all of those things at the same time. Like, right. So, For such a complex situation, it makes sense that you experience a wide range of things, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I'm very grateful for the 10 years that you've been being an admin on the Facebook group <laughs> that I can only recommend to anyone listening with a cardiac arrest survivor. Um, I just have one last question that I would like to ask you, Jasmine. Yes. Uh, is yeah, is there like a last best kind of tip that you would give to any other survivors uh, or something else, something la yeah, last word that you would like to let any survivor listening know? Keep going. I think that the view may look you know, what, what point you're at or what you're dealing with at the moment. The view looks different when a lot of time has passed. Um, so, you know, I, I'm all these years into it. And it's been a really rocky path <laughs> to get here, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I keep putting... Sometimes all you can do is just keep putting one foot after another and just keep trudging on. And, and eventually, hopefully, things will be better or you'll be better at dealing with them jasmine thank you just so much for taking your time i like i said i really appreciate it so much absolutely i'm glad to be here <laughs> and that was my conversation with fellow cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior jasmine wiley i truly hope this conversation has been helpful uh, i hope it provided some support tips and make you feel slightly less alone on this journey. As I mentioned in the intro, if you're looking for support, I, well, I first of all hope this podcast was able to provide some of that, but also try to connect with others, such as through the support group of which, which Jasmine is an admin um, from, or just any other ones, right? And I'm not trying, you know, to sell them to you or something like they're free, right? It's just that I really, I felt the tremendous benefit from being a part of a support group, whether that's online or offline, uh, of just being surrounded with people who know, who truly know what it's like to have gone through this, because it happened to them as well. Um, and if you're not yet a part of the support group, if you haven't checked them out yet, uh, such as the two Facebook groups that Jasmine is um, an admin from, or, uh, well, on the other one, she's a moderator. But if you haven't checked them out, then just check them out. That's all I can say. Um, I also wrote an article, actually, on the Heart Warrior Project, uh, where I list a whole bunch of other support groups, not just on Facebook alone, but also on Reddit and some forums. Um, and... I will link that article also in the show notes of this episode where you not alone can find any other resources such as the research papers Jasmine talked about in this episode, uh, but also that article. And once again, you can find these show notes located in the description of this episode or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Jasmine to find them. Also, if you have any feedback, um, you know, about the podcasts or you would like to share what you thought of the conversation, you can do it as well there in the show notes. With that, I am going to sign off here and I wish you nothing but the best, my dear Heart Warrior friends. And maybe I will see you again in another conversation. This is your host, Yelis Vaz, signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life.
it certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project, which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.